everyone. Um, it's a good time to start. So um, we're very happy to have Dr. Colin Blake from the University of Pennsylvania here today. Um, Dr. Blake did his uh, bachelor's at Princeton in astrophysics. He went on to a PhD at Harvard, uh, where he worked in one of the very top exoplanet groups uh, that we have here in the country. Uh, he went back to Princeton for an NSF postdoc uh, fellowship uh, for taking his current position at, at Pennsylvania, um, where he's an assistant professor. He's also the instrument scientist for NUID, uh, which is a facility class extreme precision Doppler spectrometer, which is going to be deployed at Kitt Peak uh, in a couple of years, 2019. Uh, that's, um, if you're wondering what extreme precision Doppler spectrometry means, that's pretty much what you're going to talk about. So uh, without further ado, uh, quest for small planets. Great. Thanks very much. Um, and thanks for the invitation. Very happy to be here today. Um, and to tell you about um, Minerva Red, um, which is a much smaller project that I'm working on um, in addition to NUID. Um, and I think this essentially boils down to the quest for uh, small planets. This little outline, I'll sort of give a little overview of the kind of state of exoplanet discovery. Um, talk in particular about why we should look for planets orbiting the smallest stars. Um, and also describe some new technologies that I think will enable us to, to detect planets, the, the mass and the radius of Earth orbiting other stars than our sun. Um, and I'll describe Minerva Red, which is a dedicated robotic telescope um, with a near-infrared photonic spectro spectrometer. And I'll talk a little bit about what that new technology entails. Um, and then possibly at the end or in questions, I'm happy to talk about NUID, which is, a, um, as Eileen said, a, a massive facility class instrument um, for the whole US u user community to do exoplanet science. Um, so I think it's fair to say that the last two and a half to three decades have been pretty exciting in the field of exoplanets, right? This went from one or two planets known to today we're talking about many thousands. Um, this is a pretty cool web page where you can check every day on the different discoveries and this is updated all the time. I'm sure it's already out of date since a few days ago. Um, but all of this kind of bonanza of discovery has enabled a lot of interesting science such as robust statistics. Um, we can study the atmospheres of some of these planets in certain situations. Um, we can get absorption and emission spectra of these atmospheres. Um, we can study dynamics in really complex multi-planet systems. And we can also start to do what I call rough exoplanet um, compar comparative exoplanetology. So you have two planets with similar masses. Why does one have a much bigger radius than the other? We're basically just starting to get at understanding the internal compositions of these planets. There are two main methods that have been used to discover all of these thousands of planets, and I'll describe those here. Um, the first is the Doppler wobble method, and this is primarily the method I'll talk about today. Here we're basically detecting the reflex motion of the star due to the fact that the planet and the star are orbiting a common center of mass. All right? So the name of the game is to take a high resolution spectrum of the star, you see absorption features in that spectra, and you measure tiny Doppler shifts in those features to measure the velocity of the star. So you're measuring the velocities of those stellar lines relative to some laboratory reference you have. So you do that over time, maybe you see a nice periodic signal, a variation in the velocity of the star, which we call the wobble. And with some very simple physics, basically conservation of momentum, Kepler's laws, you can get the mass of the planet times some pesky unknown sign i. A couple of numbers to think about. Jupiter going around the sun is about a 12 meter a second signal. Um, aside from the fact that it takes a long time, about 11 and a half or 12 years for Jupiter to go around the sun, we consider this easily detectable today. Earth going around the sun induces a motion of about 10 centimeters a second in the sun. That's very challenging, and that's what we're pushing towards um, right now. The other method is the transit method. Um, this is uh, really, I think, kind of a, a beautiful way to detect exoplanets. You're basically looking at a large number of stars, and you're hoping to get lucky. You're hoping that a planet is going to pass right in front of that star along your line of sight. And it causes this, this kind of characteristic diminution in brightness here, this boxy dip in the brightness of the star. Um, and the size of that dip in brightness tells you the radius of the planet. So you don't get the mass of the planet using this method, you get the radius. And again, some numbers to think about. Jupiter passing in front of the sun would be about a 1% effect. That would be measurable with a camera lens and a you know, commercially available CCD detector in your backyard. Um, Earth in front of the sun is very, very challenging. It's a very, very small effect. Um, but NASA's Kepler satellite has been specifically designed uh, to be able to detect a dip in brightness 
corresponding to the size, the planet the size of Earth. And there are many different surveys, really many of them just fancy camera lenses and commercial CCD cameras um, around the world. Um, but if you can combine these two, so if you can combine the transit with the Doppler method, you get the planet density. Right? The transit gets you the inclination because you know that the planet is going right in front of the star. So it breaks that degeneracy with the inclination of the orbit from the Doppler wobble. So if you get both observations, you've got mass, radius, you get density. So Kepler has taught us many amazing things, right? We've discovered thousands of planets with Kepler, so we can begin to do a proper census. Can answer very basic questions like how common are planets versus planet size versus the planet period. Um, Kepler has taught us that planets are very, very common, right? This is a nice plot, kind of a PR plot really from NASA, showing the relative rate of occurrence of planets for different sizes with orbital periods, I think in this case it's less than 50 days. Um, so you can see if you were to add up these bins, you get to approximately one planet per star. Um, and it's also interesting, it's the planets slightly larger than Earth, the so-called super-Earths, which seem to be the most common. We don't have an example of a super-Earth in our own solar system, so that's been very interesting. Really, Kepler has totally revolutionized this field. Before Kepler, um, this is kind of our parameter space, our discovery parameter space. This is the orbital period of the planet um, versus the planet mass, right? We have a, a large number of discoveries, getting into hundreds. But then Kepler came along and just wham, all of a sudden, you've just completely filled in this parameter space, moving way down in planet now radius, because Kepler gets you radius, not mass. So it's really opened up a whole new window on planets, and we've been able to address questions about how planets form and how they evolve uh, much more rigorously than we were able to before the launch of Kepler. So it's enabled robust statistics, things like a, a planet mass radius function that tells you how many planets there are per star as a function of planet radius, the period of the planet, and the mass of the star. Kepler, you may have heard a couple of years ago, actually um, suffered a pretty major hardware failure. It's still operating, but in a much reduced mode. Um, the end is in sight for Kepler. Uh, but thankfully, we have a brand new transit survey satellite called TESS that'll be launching in 2018. Whereas Kepler was a pencil beam survey, so focused on one part of the sky, looking at stars that were pretty faint because they're far away, TESS will do the whole sky. So it will find all the transiting planets down to a little bit bigger than Earth orbiting the brightest stars in the sky. So this will be um, extremely useful. Uh, and that's because bright stars are the best targets for different ground-based efforts to, say, measure the properties of the atmospheres of these planets. You want a bright star, if at all possible. And, and even though TESS will discover all of these planets orbiting bright stars, I want to emphasize that the radial velocities, the masses of the planets, are still required to get at the most interesting science. This is a very nice plot from a, a recent paper by Zengadal showing this is the mass of the planet versus the radius of the planet. The color coding shows you essentially how much solar radiation that planet is getting. Um, so red is it's highly irradiated, it's close into its host star, blue is less radiation. And then these lines show you our expectation for the equation of state of different materials. So this is what you expect the mass radius relation to be for a big chunk of iron. Um, there's a line there for water, the blue line. And it's pretty interesting, right? The diversity here. If you just look at planets that are around four or five Earth masses, the range in radii is a factor of a few. Right, so clearly there's a lot of interesting um, planetary physics here that we're just kind of getting to scratch the surface of. And if we can combine tests, discovered planets, with the ability to measure good masses, um, there's a lot of interesting things that will happen in the next five years. We could begin to estimate the bulk compositions of these planets, right? Just ask very simple questions like, what's the largest predominantly rocky planet that's out there? What does that tell us about how planets form? Um, people have started to this. This is a nice plot um, by a graduate student named Warren Weiss um, showing the radius of the planet versus planet density. And here we've got planets in our solar system as well as planets discovered in other solar systems. And it seems like planets with radii less than about 1.6 times the radius of Earth have predominantly rocky rocky compositions. They have densities similar to Earth or Mars. All right? So this is totally uncharted territory and we're really just beginning to scratch this surface.
So this has been a story of, of steady progress, right? This is a plot that shows the publication date of the planet um, versus the mass of the planet. And you can see right away that over time, we have been able to detect planets with lower masses. Um, detecting planets with small masses is hard. That's because they result in small signals. So this is a result of new technology and also better data analysis. Again, to measure this reflex motion of the star to get the mass of the planet, we need to measure the velocity of the star. And to do that, we're using an instrument which we usually call a Doppler spectrometer. Um, just sort of the, the schematic of what a, an astronomical spectrometer is, right? You have light usually now coming down an optical fiber from the telescope. That light is diverging out of the fiber gets collimated, so it's parallel. It's incident on some sort of dispersive element. It's almost always a grating. And then you have another lens system to focus that onto a detector, usually a two-dimensional silicon detector, a CCD detector. So a spectrometer is really just a tool for mapping wavelength to position on the detector. An example of such an instrument shown up here, again, we have very, very simple, two optical systems, a diffraction grating, a detector. And typically in this application, we use what's called a shell grating, which is a very, very high um, order. Um, you might operate it at an order of diffraction of say 50 or 100. Um, and the result is that you get spectral orders that are stacked very, very close together. And you can put in another dispersive element in the opposite direction to spread them out. So this is nice because it takes advantage of large format CCD detectors that you can kind of just buy today. So this is an example of an actual shell spectrum, and these are spectral orders, and this is wavelength. So each of these orders corresponds to a different wavelength. In practice, these can be pretty complicated instruments. Here's just an example in the lab. Um, this is an instrument called Habitable Zone Planet Finder, HPF. Um, so, you know, this is a very large cryogenic high vacuum um, type situation. So there's a lot of interesting laboratory physics here that you know, we as astronomers are just sort of um, getting into. But these can be fairly complex and, and fairly expensive instruments. And the, the trouble is that this is fundamentally a hard problem, right? The basic question we want to answer is what's the wavelength of the light falling on that pixel right there? And please give your answer to a femtometer, right? This is actually not easy to do at all. You're trying to measure something. You're trying to cha measure a change in the position of that light, which is sort of comparable, right, to the lattice of the silicon that the detector is made out of. This is a, a very, very challenging measurement. And that's why you saw over time the improvement in our ability to detect these small planets. It's really just driven by new technology. So there are lots of instrumental challenges here, and I wanted to sort of highlight some of these. One is that the index of refraction of air changes all the time as temperature changes or pressure changes. That will exactly mimic a Doppler shift in your star. So you have to have a vacuum instrument, right? Step one. Two, temperature variations. As you vary the temperature of, say, the chunks of metal that hold your optics, they could deform. That will exactly mimic a Doppler signal. So you have to have an instrument that has extremely stable temperature profile. CCD detectors, we think of them as nearly perfect today if you want to take pictures of things on the sky. But in reality, when you want to know what that that detector is doing at the level of one nanometer, it's actually really, really difficult to even quantify, but we care. Four, you have to have a really good wavelength reference, right? To measure the velocity of the star, you have to have something to compare it to. You've got to have something in your lab that you know to have zero velocity. And that ends up being a difficult challenge as well. Optical fibers. Optical fibers are fantastic for coupling spectroscopic instruments to telescopes, but at this level, they have a number of properties that end up being very, very difficult to deal with relating to speckles in the optical fiber. So that's a whole other area of investigation. And then finally, Earth's atmosphere, right? So these are all ground-based observations. So we're looking through Earth's atmosphere, which is changing all the time. Earth's atmosphere has lots of water vapor in it. Those water vapor absorption features are changing all the time, and they're superimposed right on our stellar spectrum. So we have to understand what's going on here and come up with ways to try to mitigate the effects of Earth's atmosphere. So there are many, many different challenges that you know, make it extremely difficult to actually detect a true Earth analog. Thank you.
So there are a couple of new frontiers. And one new frontier, which I, I won't really talk about, is just building a machine capable of measuring the velocity of a star to 10 centimeters a second. This is something that we think is possible, is technically challenging, um, and several groups around the world are, are working on doing this right now. Um, but I want to today highlight a newer frontier. Um, so I want to take you back to this first publication date versus planet mass plot. And here now, I want to draw your attention to the color coding which shows the mass of the star, right? So in solar masses. Um, the little stars that have masses of, say, less than a half of a solar mass have actually been mostly neglected here over the years. And there are a number of observational reasons for that, which I'll, which I'll talk about. But I think this is a really important new frontier, is the cooler stars. So, it's often said that the sun is kind of a typical star in every way. That might be true, but actually in just raw numbers, the low mass stars are actually much more numerous. So if you drew a sphere around the sun with a radius of eight parsecs, um, <clears throat> these are all the stars you've got. So this is astronomer speak, basically for the temperature of the star. So this is a very cool low mass star. This is a very large hot star. And you got 157 of these so-called M stars. These are stars that have masses less than probably about 0.4, let's say, of a solar mass. They're very, very numerous. Um, I like to show this plot because I think it's very interesting that stars are still being discovered in this volume. So W is uh, for the WISE survey, which is an infrared all sky survey, a satellite. And really in the last couple of years, WISE has found um, a number of additional very, very cool stars in our immediate backyards. They're still being discovered. Anyway, the sun is a G star. Only about 4% of the stars in this volume are like the sun. 70 or 80% are these low mass stars. Why do we care about the low mass stars, right? Um, essentially, all else being equal, if I take Earth and I plop it down a certain distance from some star, if that host star is small in mass and radius, all the signals I might hope to detect that lead me to believe that the planet is there are going to be larger. Right? The transit signal is larger. The dip in brightness is larger because the ratio of the planet radius to the star radius is more favorable if the star is small. And the Doppler wobble is also larger, again, just because the mass of the star is smaller. So in principle, it's possible to detect small planets orbiting these small stars that we would not be able to detect with current technology um, were they orbiting more massive or sun-like stars. And the other advantage, this is um, you know, something that, that's often, often cited, it's not a very well-formed idea, um, is the idea of habitability, right? So you can imagine that there is a distance from every star where you could plop a planet, and that planet would receive the same amount of radiation that we receive from the sun, okay? That's what we're showing here. This is distance from the star, and this is mass of the star on the y-axis, and that blue zone is the location you need to put that planet to get the same amount of insulation the same amount of radiation that we get from the sun. Perhaps not surprisingly, for low mass stars, you've got to put that planet way in because the star is small and it's cool. It's not very powerful. And then I've overplotted here in red, that's the size of the Doppler wobble for an Earth mass planet in the habitable zone of these different stars. So for Earth, it's about 10 centimeters a second. But if I take Earth and I put it down in the habitable zone of a very small star, it gets up towards more like one meter a second. So there's a big advantage here, actually. If you want to find planets in their stars' habitable zones, these small stars are the place to look. Please, yeah. So, yeah, so it, it has to do with the, the mass, you know, the, the, the mass temperature relationship for the stars. Right, so what really matters um, is the temperature of the star in determining the equilibrium temperature of the, of the planet. Um, and so I'm plotting mass here. So there's a mass temperature relationship for the stars, which is encoded in that blue line. Do you mean the wavy width? Oh, the wavy width is just basically, this is pretty schematic. But that knee there, that's real. Other questions? Okay. All right, and this has been done. You may have seen in the news that there was an Earth mass planet found essentially in the habitable zone of a very nearby star, one of the nearest stars to the sun, uh, Proxima Sen. 
And you may have also read about the system of now seven planets orbiting this very, very low mass star, and the system's called TRAPPIST-1. Right? So this is something that lots of different groups around the world are, are after, is looking for these planets orbiting the smallest stars. And we want to answer the question, you know, this is TRAPPIST-1. So you see you have a number of planets really way close in. The Earth is one AU from, from our Sun, and we have planets that are all closer than a tenth of an AU. And we think there's sort of tantalizing statistical evidence that these very compact systems of rocky planets around low-mass stars seem to be very common. So that's, that's something we're, we're very excited about. And we want to go out and confirm that this is true and find this, this bounty of planets. But there's still lots of work to be done. So this is a plot that shows basically the temperature of the star, hotter over here, um, versus the size of the Doppler wobble of the planet, the signal we're looking for. And these are known planets from a website called the Exoplanet Orbit Database. And you can see there's kind of a conspicuous absence of planets known orbiting the coolest stars. But it's surprising, right? Because I just told you that the small, cool stars are more numerous than larger stars. Um, and we also have this tantalizing evidence that these cool stars may actually have more planets on average than the more massive stars. So what gives? There's an enormous observational bias here. And it's due to the fact that most astronomical spectrometers are built fundamentally to work at what we call optical wavelengths, basically 500 nanometers. Um, historically, that's because that's where CCD, silicon-based detectors, are, are the most sensitive. It also happens to be where the sun is essentially the brightest. So this is a histogram um, that shows you the number of stars, I think in this case it's uh, within eight parsecs of the sun, um, versus their magnitude, which is an annoying astronomer unit, um, but this is uh, much fainter than this. Um, in infrared, so at 850 nanometers, and what we call V-band, green light, 550 nanometers. So you can see that the stars are just much, much brighter in the infrared than they are in the optical, and that's because they're cool. So if you have a limited amount of observing time with your instrument designed to work at this wavelength, you're simply not going to observe very many of these stars. There's a huge observational bias. And that's what Minerva Red is all about. It's a dedicated observatory for discovering and characterizing planets orbiting uh, the closest low mass stars to the sun. And this is a collaboration between myself and some students at UPenn and some other folks um, around the world. So we began this project by essentially asking what's the largest telescope you can kind of just buy. So I mean, you know, call somebody up and this thing shows up not in years but in a few months. Um, it turns out it is this. Um, it's a 0.7 meter telescope made by a company in California um, called Plane Wave. Um, these people have completely revolutionized, actually, the whole business of telescopes in this size range. They mass produce these things, and they brought the price down by a factor of several compared to the uh, compared to the competition. It's a really nice thing. It's not even that big. It's a little bit taller than I am. Um, it's fully robotic. They have beautiful software um, that'll just run the thing. You can run it from your home. It's great. Um, it has Naismith ports, so that's really nice. So a lot of telescopes will have a focus at the bottom, which we call a maybe a Cassegrain focus. But this actually has a tertiary mirror, a third mirror that brings the focus over to either side. It's really nice for mounting instruments. It means that your instrument has a constant gravity vector. It's not moving all around as you scan across the sky. So anything, this thing is fantastic and it's not, I mean, really that expensive, right? It's easily at the scale of, you know, an expensive piece of apparatus for a chemistry lab or a condensed matter physics lab. Um, it's something that a lot of universities could get into. They actually make a one meter one now as well, please. Yeah, it's about two hundred and ten thousand dollars for this one. Yep. What, what's that? <laughs> I, I, we, there are people who have individuals who have them. They've made about thirty of these things that are operating around the world, um, and they're not all at universities. Some apparently they're in some some people's backyards. I guess maybe if you had a you know a, a fancy sailboat, it's a similar scale of hobby. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> All right, so we got one of these things. Ours is located at Mount Hopkins um, in Arizona. So this is the Smithsonian Observatory site in southern Arizona. It's a very, very nice site for doing astronomy. Um, it lives in this kind of ingenious little fiberglass hut that just opens and closes. That's all it does. Keeps the rain out. Very reliable. You'll see that ours actually has a gold mirror. 
Um, this is something I didn't realize until I started researching this, that um, you usually coat a telescope mirror in aluminum. But aluminum apparently has kind of a minimum of reflectivity at around 850 nanometers, which I'll tell you in advance is exactly the wavelength that, that I want to use. Um, so all the mirrors in this thing are gold coated. So it means that because there are three mirrors, it actually makes a huge difference, right? So if I have, at aluminum has a reflectivity of say 0.8, you know, a cube that, it starts to be a real problem. So we have gold mirrors. The next question we wanted to ask is, you know, what wavelength do we want to use? If I could just design an instrument with no constraints, one of the very first questions I would have to answer is what wavelengths do I want my spectrometer to cover in my spectrum? Well, we want to work in the optical in that we want to use a CCD detector. So silicon detectors now you can buy in very large format. They have beautiful noise properties. They're not very expensive. You can buy similar devices in terms of size of device to work in the infrared, but they're astronomically expensive. So we're going to use a CCD. So that means you're constrained to wavelengths less than a micron. CCDs don't work at all past a micron. But you have to start thinking about Earth's atmosphere as well, right? So in Earth's atmosphere, you have prominent bands due to oxygen and water. And want to avoid those bands if at all possible, particularly the water vapor. So you're kind of left with two choices. You can work in this region or this region. And astronomers call this Z-band. It's actually an extremely clean portion of Earth's atmosphere. So I'm going to focus on that, Z-band. So I designed and built a very simple spectrometer. This is literally made from parts out of a Thorlabs catalog. Um, this vacuum chamber is something you can just call up and buy. That's a commercial CCD camera. You know, obviously this says Lowe's on it. You know, it's made out of things from, from the, you know, the Home Depot and Lowe's. Um, <clears throat> so it's a vacuum chamber both to keep air out so you don't have any variations in the index of refraction inside your optical system and also to help keep the temperature nice and stable. It's a commercial CCD, a bit expensive, but again, something you, you can just buy. And in terms of the mechanical aspects of this instrument, it's really, it's designed to be intrinsically stable to the level of about one meter a second. So that means if I do nothing, I don't calibrate this instrument at all, I take spectra of my star, I should, in principle, be able to detect variations in the velocity of the star of this order. So it's a very, very stable instrument. It lives in this foam igloo, and we have heaters in there to try to control the temperature of the whole apparatus to a few millikelvin. <laughs> and the whole thing is about a meter, right? So it's a tabletop instrument. It's just an overlay of the optics inside. Um, for those interested in spectroscopy, it's a resolution of about 50,000, which is actually a little low. You might like 100,000, but then that makes the whole thing much, much bigger, so it's beyond the scope of this project. Um, and it covers a, a pretty modest wavelength range, really just kind of 100 nanometers or so um, of usable spectrum. And this is all catalog parts, optics, two-inch optics, standard stuff out of Thor. Um, yeah. So the thermal stability is really important because if you wanted to make a list of all the things that could masquerade as a planet or corrupt your data in some way, periodic temperature swings in your instrument would be item number one. So we really want to work on keeping the temperature of this thing down as much as possible. And specifically, the goal is to have plus or minus 10 millikelvin stability of all the optics inside forever. Um, you can reach actually the conclusion that 10 meters a second or 10 millikelvin is important um, because the, the grating, right, so the primary dispersive element, uh, is a grating that's deposited on a special type of glass called zero door that has extremely low coefficient of thermal expansion, but it's not zero. So if you twiddle the temperature of that grating by 10 millikelvin, it will cause the locations of all of the diffracted light on your detector to move just a little bit. And that little bit it is the same as the star moving one, meters a one meter a second. So that's what sets the temperature scale. So we're going to stick this thing in a box, minimize any thermally conductive pass to the outside, and then actively control the temperature just using simple heaters so that it's a few degrees warmer inside the box than it is outside. And that's nice because that means it's very easy to cool it. You just flip off the heaters and the temperature will drop very quickly.
Um, working with my student, Dave Slisky, uh, he's developed what we call an environmental control system. So um, again, this is all catalog stuff. This is stuff you might have in your lab, you know, Stanford Research Systems, temperature controllers. Basically, this thing is hooked up some resistors inside. You press go, and it controls the temperature of the apparatus to better than our 10 millikelvin goal. Really, it's a few millikelvin. Um, and I show this plot because this is the lab ambient over a month. So the temperature is changing by a couple of degrees in the lab. Um, and the purple is the temperature of the optics inside the chamber and is changing by a few millikelvin, even during a period where somebody turned off the AC in the lab. Um, so it, it works pretty well. And again, it's all, all very off the shelf type stuff. Um, and this is really only possible because the instrument is small. Right? If we had to do this on a very large scale for a very large telescope, you wouldn't be able to use this sort of off the shelf, low cost approach. You might ask, why is there such a why is it such a tiny instrument? Um, other instruments in the world that do this science, you know, might be the size of a of a truck, something like this. Um, it's because this particular instrument is fed by a single mode fiber. So optical fibers, right, a glass conduit that transmits light because of total internal reflection, can be large and can have many, many modes, like thousands of modes of propagation, or they can be very small and they can have maybe one or two modes of propagation. So we call the small thing a single mode fiber. So this is just like having a spectrograph with a very small slit. You may know that if you turn down the size of the slit on your spectrograph, you increase the spectral resolution of your instrument. So that's basically what we're doing here. Another advantage of using the, the single mode fiber um, is it doesn't suffer from some of these absolutely terrible types of noise we call modal noise. Um, and actually, I figured out you can sort of see this here. Okay, so I don't know if you can see. Um, we have the laser beam here, and you see this speckly business over on the side. I'm guessing that's a secondary reflection in here. Um, optical fibers do that. And if you have a large multimode fiber, you get that speckly pattern. And then because the star is moving, at the focal plane of your telescope, that pattern is changing and evolving all the time. Terrible. Looks just like the Doppler shift you're looking for. So this is something people have worked really hard to figure out how to mitigate. Um, they do things like you agitate the fibers and all this crazy stuff and you can you can suppress it. But if you have a single mode fiber, this just doesn't happen. It's just not an issue. So that's another major reason to use single mode fiber. Um, you might say, yeah, but okay, wait a minute. How are you going to get any light at all down that optical fiber? Good question. Uh, oh yeah, and on top of that, a single mode fiber only propagates a single Gaussian mode, and there is no way that the star on the sky is going to have a Gaussian in uh, intensity profile. In fact, if you have a telescope of any appreciable size, you know, 30, 40, 50 centimeters, the star is going to look more like that than it is like that. All right, so this seems like quite a challenge. So the way we're doing this is we're using a, a very simple, um, it's not even really adaptive optic system, it's more of an active optic system. Um, this is a commercial, again this is something you can buy, shown right here. This is a tip tilt plate, which is at pretty high speed, say 5, 10, maybe 20 hertz if it's a bright star, is actively stabilizing the location of the star to keep it right on our fiber. And that ends up being uh, very important. But this is only something that'll work on telescopes this big, right? Once you get a several meter telescope, um, the, the diffraction pattern, the aberrated pattern of light is just so complicated. There's really no way you could hope to concentrate that light with such a simple apparatus. So because we have a 0.7 meter telescope, this is feasible. Um, because obviously all of this really requires that you can couple light into the single mode fiber, um, we've done a lot of tests on trying to see if this actually works. Most of these tests have happened in, uh, in Philadelphia where the conditions are terrible, uh, but that's actually okay for this type of test, right? It's kind of a worst case scenario. So we've done tons of tests where we've taken different types of fibers and we've hooked them up to our small telescope, a 10 inch telescope, um, and just measured how much light is coming through our science fiber. Um, and sort of much to my surprise, we figured out it's, it's a few percent. It's not 0.01%, which is what some people told me it would definitely be. Um, and that's definitely not 100% either, right? It's, it's in the regime of, of workable. If we can get a few percent of the, the stellar photons, we can do the science we want. So we're very happy with, with that.
<clears throat> Another major issue, right, once I've got a spectrum of my star, um, I have to calibrate that spectrum. I have to know what is the wavelength of the light falling right there on that detector. And there are lots of interesting ways to do this. I showed in that plot about how our detection capabilities have improved throughout time. You know, from 1995 to 2015, a lot of that is related to coming up with new and super clever ways of doing this. So one advance is the, the laser frequency cone, which is a way to use nonlinear optics and a femtosecond pulse laser to produce a forest of emission lines that are essentially a perfect calibrator for this type of thing. But that's really expensive. That's, say, a million dollar type piece of apparatus. We'd love to figure out an inexpensive way to do that. Luckily, I have a postdoc named Sam who is like super world expert on optical fibers for astronomy. Um, and he realized that you could actually build a Fabry Pro cavity right out of optical fiber. So we usually think of a Fabry Pro cavity as two highly polished mirrors separated by just a little bit. And that cavity transmits certain modes. So if I put white light through my Fabry Pro cavity, I get a forest of emission lines out the other side. And if my cavity is really good and it's really stable, you could use something like this to calibrate your instrument. But Sam realized you could take two fibers, you could polish them, and you could put them really close together in some sort of ferrule, and then you could back like that, and you could produce something that looks like this. So on the top, this is an example of an emission neon lamp spectrum. So you could use that neon lamp to calibrate your instrument, right? You know the wavelengths of each of those neon features, but not too many of them. If we use Sam's Fiber Fabry Pro Gizmo, wham, you get a beautiful forest of lines. Obviously, you know, hundreds of times more information in that calibration source than the emission line lamp. So this is the type of device we're going to use for calibrating the wavelength scale of the instrument. Please. So the cavity, is that the Yeah, so it has certain frequency modes. So each of these dots corresponds to a different frequency mode of the, of the cavity. So you can just change the size of the cavity and then put a different one? You could, but actually we want to do the flip of it, we want to set it up and make it rock solid, never changing. So in practice, what you would do is you would take this thing and you would just embed it in a giant chunk of copper and then control the temperature of that extremely well, like a micro Kelvin. And then that sets the spacing of your cavity to be stable. So we don't want these things to move at all. But you're absolutely right, you could tune it by tweaking the temperature. You could make these dots march across. So, but we want, to, we want to specifically not do that. <laughs> Please, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So we've taken the approach in this project to kind of either completely avoid or come up with inexpensive approaches to the six major instrumentation challenges I highlighted. Put this thing in an off-the-shelf vacuum chamber. Um, use inexpensive components, sometimes from Home Depot, to keep it temperature stable. I won't talk about this, but this is actually a, a really big one. We worry a lot about CCD detectors when we're thinking about next generation instruments for measuring 10 centimeter a second velocities of stars. Um, there are a lot of issues here. Just one to highlight is that when I read out my CCD detector, I make heat. And that causes a deformation of the detector, right? The thing potato chips, it has to happen. Now it's not a lot of heat being generated, so the deformations are expected to be at the sort of one nanometer or two nanometer type level. But for this science, that matters. So that's an example of the type of thing we're worrying about for the next generation instrument. We have an inexpensive wavelength reference that Sam developed. Uh, we use a single mode fiber which has no speckle effects. And we're going to get around the problems of Earth's atmosphere by just completely avoiding them. Only working at wavelengths that are very clean. That Z-band 850 to 900 nanometer uh, window between water vapor absorption. A uh, little status update. So this is a picture of a place called the Ridge at Mount Hopkins. So it's not the very summit of Mount Hopkins. It's a little bit down below. There are lots of little telescopes here doing all sorts of interesting stuff. We've had our telescope there from about 2015. And we're gearing up to take our spectrometer uh, in 2017. So in the next couple of months, go out there and set it up. Um, it will join a colony, kind of, of telescopes called the Minerva Project. So we actually have five of these 0.7 meter telescopes installed here. Um, the four in the back are doing exoplanet science at optical wavelengths. 
And then that's Minerva Red in the front. So John Johnson, who's now at Harvard, is the PI of the four telescopes in the back. So we work together and, and share resources. And these telescopes and instruments have very complementary capabilities. So my instrument is designed for the red or the infrared, and these are designed for the optical. So we can look at completely different targets. Here's some gratuitous drone footage just showing you that <laughs> this stuff actually exists. There it is. It may start moving. Yeah, there you go. Anyway, the folks from this telescope company were super excited about, about this footage. It's <laughs> right up there on their webpage. <laughs> And what are we going to do? We are going to look at nearby stars that have names, right? Stars you know, Barnard Star, Wolf 359, literally our nearest neighbors. And we're just going to bang away at these stars for a few years um, and just try to really do a census of the inner regions of these, plan of these stars for rocky planets. So it's designed to detect these planets, and our goal is better than one meter a second precision uh, for any M star within eight parsecs of the sun, which would get you Earth in the habitable zone. So I'll just leave up some conclusions. Um, if there are any questions, I'm, I'm happy to take them. Thanks very much. The velocity you're trying to measure is much less than the thermal velocity of the atoms. So that's right. That's why the centroid is very careful. Exactly. So um, that's exactly right. So the, the stars have thermally broadened, pressure broadened, and then rotationally broadened lines. So the basic trick, sort of conceptually, is that you have to have many thousands of these lines, and then you're going to measure the net shift in the centroids of the lines. So any one line won't, won't do it. You need to have a lot of them. Yep. And then you hope that you can use root n to get you down to better than a meter a second. So we're going to low mass stars with certain times. Is there does the mass of the star set like the range of planet masses in some way that could be around it? Yeah, so it's been known for some time um, that low mass stars don't seem to have any of these hot Jupiters. So the first planets that were discovered in the 90s um, were these Jupiter mass planets that had orbital periods of like three, five days, something like that. So way close in. Um, it's still a bit of a mystery how you form that planet. Um, but anyway, that would be relatively easy to detect around a low-mass star. The signal would be huge. It would be hundreds of meters a second, let's say. Um, we don't really see any of those. So we do know that the mass of the star has something to do with how planets form and how they migrate after they're born. So yeah, the planet populations are somewhat different between a small star and a big star. Yeah. I don't know, this might be something that's still new to work out in models, but maybe it's going to be more dynamically unstable if all the class of this together. Uh, yes, yeah, so... Yeah, that, that's a different factor in having a that is maybe... Yeah, so it's, it's pretty interesting, actually, that we see some of these systems with a whole bunch, a whole bunch, five, let's say, planets, very, very compact. Um, because you can imagine, you know, not you know, actually doing the dynamics, but just the parameter space for an unstable configuration to come up is seems much, much larger when you have a bunch of planets close in, right? So it's actually a bit surprising, I think, to dynamicists that we're finding so many of these systems, um, because you might think that they're likely to be unstable. And TRAPPIST is a pretty old star, right? So that system of planets has been there for billions of years. Um, so yeah, the, but that's a good question too about the habitability and if these things are in resonances, for example, what does that do um, to, you know, to the evolution of climate on the planet? Lots of interesting questions there. So when you measure the wobble, yeah. that assigns a sign I term, mm -hmm. so that's the angle of incidence? Exactly, yeah, so that's like, you don't know if this is the plane of the solar system that you're looking at, if it's like that, or if it's like that. Right? So if it's exactly perpendicular, you see no wobble, but it could just be a degree off. And that means it could be a, you know, a giant planet or even another star in a highly inclined orbit, and you have no way of knowing. So if you combine that with the transit, right. does that also contain information about the incidence? It does. Just because the, the you know, let's call it the, the bandwidth for the planet to be seen as transiting from your point of view is usually like a couple degrees. So if you see the planet transit at all, you know that it's a, a couple degrees from edge on. And then actually the shape how steep the ingress and egress, the edges of the transit event are, actually can tell you the chord across the star. So you can actually solve for the inclination to like 0.1 degrees or something like that. So it's 
more rare that you find in transit. Exactly. But those are the most valuable cases because then you get the mass and the radius and you get the density. So it turns out to be, I, I showed a plot of um, planet density and the, the error bars were fairly big. Um, and that's actually driven by the uncertainty in the radius of the planet, which is in turn driven by the uncertainty in the radius of the star. So the flow down is you, you get a transit, the depth of the transit tells you the radius of the planet if and only if you know the radius of the star. So you sort of get the temperature of the star, you compare it to some model, and actually it's not that good. We don't know the radii of stars in general that well. So that's the dominant source of error in the measurement of the density of the planet, is the uncertainty in the radius of the star. Um, it definitely does, yeah. So if you do know the distance to the star, that can help a lot. Um, because if you can measure, right, if you measure the temperature of the star and then you know the distance, then you can use the thermal emission laws to try to estimate the radius. Um, but typically the way this is sort of anchored to reality is that you have a um, binary star system. So if you have two eclipsing stars, um, you can actually figure out the radii of both quite well. So we have, you know, some handful of those, which are direct physical measurements of the radii of stars, which anchor all of our other estimates of the radii of stars. And there's just some uncertainty there. It's not so good. It might be like 10%. Right? It's, not, it's not perfect. So I'm kind of troubled by you skipping over your uh, thermal noise and the CCD issue. Yeah. Readout. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's 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 tough, right? Because really, what you want to build to characterize how your CCD detector behaves in time is a super duper expensive Doppler spectrometer for finding planets. So it's a bit of a chicken and an egg problem. Um, and typically, the CC the people who manufacture these CCDs say, oh, "Never, kind of never thought about that before. Good luck." Um, so there are ways that people are trying to to figure this out. Like you can imagine, there might be some clever interferometric thing you could do by bouncing light off of the surface of your CCD, right? Because it's partially reflective. So it absorbs 99% of the light, but it reflects 1% of the light. So there might be something interesting you could do with, you know, an interference pattern. Um, so people are trying to are trying to look at that. Um, but really the best way probably to get at this is to, you know, project light that looks like that on your detector and then try to measure how the positions of the spots are changing under the assumption that the spots aren't actually moving, the detector's moving. But it's tough, because we need to do this to a nanometer. A question about uh, transits in general mm -hmm. detection method. Is the possibility that the transiting object is not located in the solar system of the star that it's eclipsing, something that you have to consider, and is there a way you would account for that? Yeah, okay, so uh, one of the many interesting things that the Kepler mission has taught us is that nature can conspire to make things that look just like transits in all of these creative ways we never suspected. Um, so the worst one is that you have two stars eclipsing each other. That's fine. If they're similar mass stars, then you're going to have, you know, a 50% drop in brightness, right? That would be easily detectable. But if you're unlucky and that pair of stars is just lined up with another star behind, that star behind dilutes the effect and it can look exactly like a transiting Earth. So there are lots of different ways that that can happen involving more stars. Um, you have to be careful. You have to do additional follow-up observations to try to rule out those types of possibilities. A quick follow-up. Yeah. Could you then make observations at different points in the Earth's path in order to, if, that, if the, the parallax from that would be enough to shift the alignment? Yeah. So if the star, um, if the interloping binary star were close, to us, that would that would do it for you. But most of them are pretty far away, so the parallax is too small to offset the alignment. But that, I mean, that certainly would be one way to do it. And if you had some super duper astrometric machine, you might actually be able to de to detect that. But. Instagram, the observatory that's in there was a large dearth of 
Jupiter and super Jupiter starts to find Yeah. Is that another observational bias or is that just Yeah, so let me formation doesn't that's that's planet formation. I'll go back. So this plot here has been, you know, fully corrected for the observational biases we can think of. So this is the real underlying occurrence rate. So this guy is actually much easier to detect. So the fact that they are relatively rare means that they are relatively rare. Yeah, so people have tried hard to correct for observational biases here. Is this partly because there's just so many more M stars than yeah, so that is certainly, that's certainly part of it, but then the other part is I, I think just, you know, stars are born with disks of material, and those disks of material only make so many big planets, but they can make a lot of these planets. So this is thought to be, you know, a result of how planets form. So it's unusual in that we don't have any of these guys. That is, that's correct. Yeah, it's somewhat unusual. Um, so it means our kind of you know basic notions of planetary science really need to be expanded a lot to account um, for these super Earths and mini Neptunes. Yeah, it's a different beast. Don't know. Do we have? Um, is there an estimate of the mass for that? Yeah, I'd, I don't know. So you're talking about the what would they call it? Planet Ten. Yeah, X10. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess not. I think, well, I don't want to give an answer that, that I don't know to be correct, but I do believe that from infrared sky surveys, there are fairly stringent limits on big planets in the way outer solar system. And I think that a many times the mass of Earth thing would be excluded. Certainly, Jupiters are excluded. You would see that in an infrared sky survey. I think Okay, then yeah, that could if it's if it's ten Earth mass, then we would consider that a super Earth. That's right. Yep. Is there any space if you do polarized life? Yeah. Okay. So um, people have been looking for rings around planets from the early days, and nobody has ever found an analog of Saturn's rings. But that's a situation where you might see a polarized signal. So if the ice particles in the rings are coherently aligned in some way, you can imagine that you could have a reflected signal from the star off the ring that might be highly polarized. And people have looked for this and they've never seen anything. Yeah. It's actually, it's, people have tried hard to find both moons and rings and they haven't found either. Of the star, very, very low. So you can have some unusual types of stars. I'm not an expert on this, but maybe some very young stars that are undergoing, maybe they have jets and those are polarized. But your average star on the sky is, um, I think it's less than a part in a million sometimes. I mean, it's very, very small. Yeah, there, there are a couple, there are actually, I think, maybe eight different ways people have figured out how to do this. There two, one is that you could see a transit, and then you could see kind of a subsidiary transit. That would be like the easiest way. People have looked like crazy for that, never found that. Um, another thing that you could do is, as the moon is orbiting the planet, they're both orbiting the common center of mass. So the planet actually moves a little bit at the orbital period of the moon, which would change the phasing of this effect. So you might see a signal that's periodic at the orbit of the planet around the star, but then also periodic at the period of the moon around the planet. That makes sense. I haven't found that either, but not for lack of trying. People have really tried. <laughs> Look like your ability to um, to test the nanometer scale mm -hmm. of your CCD was limited by the finesse of your fiber of the row. Yes. So do you try to do stuff like have concave fiber tips or fiber reflectivity? Or cascade multiple. Um, so yeah, so have multiple cavities and, and lock them to each other and cascade them. So and yeah, in a you know, a deployed to the field system, you might have a series of these cavities to try to drive up the finesse that way. But you're absolutely right, we are somewhat limited by the finesse. Yeah. <laughs>
far is the distant, most distant planet that has been detected so far? My guess is, so people have talked about planets detected in other galaxies and Andromeda, but leave that aside. Um, my guess is that people have detected planets between us and the bulge of our galaxy using gravitational microlensing. Um, and I just would guess that on average, those planets are halfway between us and the bulge of the galaxy. So four kiloparsecs, something like that would be my, my best guess. But that's a handful, it's not many. Is there any disturbance that could be because of the interstellar dust, for example? Do, do people think it's a combat? Um, you mean like uh, making a, a, a signal, a fake signal that looks like, yeah, so I haven't heard too much about this. So the, you know, the, the time scales for these transit events are like hours. But I would imagine the time scale for some sort of star moving relative to some dust, even if the dust has a lot of structure in it, would be much longer. And then these are periodic. So in order to call this a planet, Kepler would see this, you know, four or five times, right? And have a clear periodic um, signal. So that really strongly discriminates against, against stuff like that. So you mentioned that there are difficulties in the observation because of like the atmosphere and mm -hmm. fluctuation. Yeah. If let's say we have it by twenty thirty five a moon base. Yep. And we were able to set up like a mini uh, observatory. Uh, what kind of um, improvement resolution do you expect? And what kind of observation observational techniques can we do that we can't do? That? So the main advantage is um, you could really move out to longer wavelengths of light from one micron to five microns, which are heavily polluted, polluted, contaminated by water vapor um, in our atmosphere. It makes it really difficult to do ground-based precision astronomy at those wavelengths. Um, so my guess is that people would you know, take an instrument like we have on the Earth and just operating it up there would dramatically increase its spectral grasp, its bandwidth. Um, and then that, that would just be much better. You could also observe all the time, right, if you're on the, so that, that would be cool too. So you don't have any issues with aliasing against your day-night cycle on Earth or anything like that. Just curious, you mentioned you have like a few percent through the whole instrument. Yeah. Um, so what's the, the optical power at the end? It's, yeah, that's interesting. Um, it is, okay, so for a bright star, like Vega, um, we do, it's probably um, tens of millions of photons per second per nanometer of spectrum for a 10 inch telescope. So you're doing- So it's a lot, it's still a lot of photons. So you're doing single photon We could, but actually um, the noise properties of the detector are more favorable if you integrate. But there are, so you could um, you can get single photon counting CCDs. Um, we don't tend to use them all that much in astronomy. Um, and that's because um, the gain is some super duper high number that enables you to count a single photon, but you don't know what that gain is. You just know it's a big number and it changes in time. So it's hard to make precise measurements of flux with these things. All right, thanks very much.